chapter 3 tonight. Let's ask God's blessing on the Bible as we uh, look at it together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the ministering spirits, Lord, that uh, strengthen us. And Lord, that God that watches over us day by day. And God, for your protection, your guidance, your provision. Lord, I pray tonight that you would bless the Word of God. I pray that you give us understanding. God, help us to be able to absorb and retain these things, that we have a framework for understanding what we're reading. Teach us and exhort us tonight, I pray from your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 3 and verse number 1 through 12, the Bible says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Now when you read of that, <clears throat> it's talking when, it, when the Bible talks about, specifically in the New Testament, it talks about the circumcision. It's talking about the people who are under that covenant, and that was a very important token of, of uh, their covenant with God is that token of circumcision. So the circumcision is a, is a generic term talking about Jewish people, okay? So what advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of the circumcision? Much, every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. Did you know that every author of every book of your Bible was a Jew? God gave the revelation of Scripture through the Jewish people, and so we owe them a huge debt when it comes to that. Uh, to them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. For as it is, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, might overcome when thou art judged. <clears throat> but if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. In other words, I speak as some people would make that argument. Verse number six, God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? So what he's saying, some people would say, well, the fact that I lie and I'm, I commit that sin, it exalts the glory of God and shows how much better he is. And so, uh, so some would say, verse number six, and rather as we slanderously be reported and some affirm that we say, let us do e evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. And that's very similar to what some people say, you know, if you believe in eternal security, it's like a license to sin. And it's, it's just a, a silly, foolish argument, has no truth in it at all. Verse number nine, what then? Are we better than they, as Jews? Are they better than the Gentiles? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understand it. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So when you read this passage, and there's other similar scriptures in the New Testament, you can't help but wonder, what is the relationship between Jews and Gentiles now that Christ is risen? And, and why is there the distinction and what's going on there? And uh, that's what we're going to look at in the Bible tonight so that you can understand the special place of Israel in the sight of God. And perhaps one of the clearest places in Scripture that we can see this special place for Israel is back in Psalm 89 and verses 20 to 37. Turn back there if you would, please. Psalm 89, starting in verse number 20. Psalm 89, verse number 20, the Bible says, I have found David my servant. Now that's literal, historical King David of Israel. I have found David my servant, with my uh, holy oil have I anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face, and plague them that hate him. My, but my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea, and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also, I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. And if you're an underliner, you ought to write that, underline that down, because there's an, a lot of people today who will say, God's all through with Israel, he's all done dealing with Israel, and, and it's all over. But he said, my mercy will I keep with him forevermore, and my covenant uh, shall stand fast with him. 
his seed also will I make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. So that's that covenant we were talking about last time, that God said, look, if you, don't, if you disobey me and you get out of line, I'm going to deal with you and deliver you to the enemies. Verse number 33, Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him. Again, underline that. I will not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that is gone out of my lips. Once have I sworn by my holiness that I will not lie unto David. His seed shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon, and as a faithful witness in heaven, Selah. And Selah is kind of like, that's it, that's all. <laughs> So God makes it very clear, several times very declarative statements, that his covenant will not be broken. He will not utterly forsake them. He will not totally put them aside. And that is unique to Israel as a nation. It's unique to David as Israel's king. And often what is called the sure mercies of David. That says God's giving him a guarantee, if you will, and a promise that he would have a descendant on, his, on the throne of his kingdom forever. So that promise is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And you see some shades of that if you look back at verse number, uh, verse number 27. I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. That's Jesus Christ is the ultimate fulfillment, uh, having descended from David. So now we get to, before we get to the kingdom part, let's start back where God began with calling out a nation and what made Israel so special in the beginning. And God calls out a nation of people through his covenant, through one man, who is in, you'll see him referred to by two names. And initially he's called Abram, and then God changes his name to Abraham. Same person, okay? So look at Genesis, or, well, let me read you first of all, Galatians 3 and verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. That is for him and for those who, who came from his physical line genealogy, if you will. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So we, we see that it's a very specific line. It's a very specific group of promises to a very specific group of people who are literally uh, ethnically and physiologically related through, through uh, coming from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right, so let's start back at Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 1. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1, this is where God begins dealing with the man called uh, Abram and, uh, and God making some promises to him. Genesis chapter 12 and verse number 1, and as we go through this here and we get further on down the line, you'll see why this is important because having a proper perspective of these things and the place of Israel is really essential and fundamental to understanding much of your Bible. Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter 12, verse number 1, now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, king, kindred, sorry, he was living in Ur of the Chaldees, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. So Ur of the Chaldees is over in the area of Iraq, Iran. It's in that area of the Middle East. And he's saying, you're going to leave here, and you're going to start traveling west, and I'm going to show you where you're going to go. He said, well, where am I going? You'll know when you get there. <laughs> and that's really, he says, the land that I will show thee. Verse number two, and I will make of thee a great nation. That's where it all started, with one man. God says, Abram, I'm going to make out of you, from your descendants, a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And verse number three is very important. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So from that time on, you don't want to be offsides or you don't want to be in the place of attacking or going after the seed of Abraham. God said, I'll bless them and bless thee and curse them and curse thee. <clears throat> so that covenant, and, and we won't look into all that specifics tonight, but that covenant involved three basic areas. It was a promised land. He said, go to the land that I'll show you. A promised provision and a promised protection. 
And God uh, had that as if they were God's people. He provided for them supernaturally. Think about when they're journeying through the wilderness. He protected them supernaturally so many times. And by the way, if you're writing notes down, this covenant is confirmed to Isaac in Genesis chapter 26 and again to Jacob in Genesis chapter 35. And so uh, even Abraham didn't take it literally at first. And he thought perhaps there was an exception or, you know, maybe God, you didn't really mean this literally. But look at Genesis chapter 17 and verse number 18. So Abraham had been promised that he would have a child through Sarah, but there was a problem. And that was Sarah was getting extremely old and she hadn't had any child yet. She was barren. She was childless. Genesis chapter 17, verse number 18. And Abraham, Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And so Ishmael was a son of, uh, of Abraham through his bondmaid Hagar, and that was a whole mistaken situation. And whenever you, you read about that in the Bible, whenever we get in and try to fix things for God and get out of God's plan, we always end up messing things up. And, and Ishmael is the father generically of the Arab nations, which have become em enemies of Israel for generations and generations. And I'm sure Abraham rues the day. <laughs> That, uh, that he decided to go that route. Uh, but he said, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. So Abraham in his reasoning was thinking, well, Lord, you said I'd have a son. I kind of do have a son. Like a, you know, it's not exactly like you said, but when God does something, he's going to do it exactly like he said. He said, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, verse number 19, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. And thou shalt call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. So the Bible makes it very clear that the line goes Abraham, not Ishmael, but Isaac. So that, because there was another son there. And so then uh, you'll find the same thing true with uh, Jacob, who becomes the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, because Jacob also had a brother. And look at Genesis 25, verse number 21. So God establishes his covenant with a very, not just from Abraham, yes, it starts with Abraham, but it's not like all people related to Abraham. It's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's why you'll see those three lumped together many times in Scripture, because it's very exclusive, that direction. Verse number 21 of Genesis 25, And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord, uh, so, so this was also the case with Isaac's wife, uh, who was, who was a, Isaac was the son of, of, uh, of Sarah, and now his wife, Rebekah, is barren as well. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. Verse 22, And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. So God is already identifying before they're even born that Jacob, uh, Esau is the firstborn. Jacob is going to be the younger. Jacob will become the line of the covenant and not Esau. Watch how this comes to pass. Chapter 27, verse 33. Genesis chapter 27, verse number 33. And so later the boys are grown and now it's time, Isaac is nearing the time of his death and he's going to pronounce the blessing on his sons and, and typically, as was the tradition at that time, the eldest son got the blessing and got the, all the goods and all that sort of thing. Uh, Genesis 27 verse 33, And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that hath taken venison and brought it to me? And I have eaten of all that all before thou camest and have blessed him Yea, and he shall be blessed. So what happened was, if you know the story, uh, Jacob had come in subversively, and he had gotten the blessing. His Isaac was very old at the time, and he couldn't see. He thought he was blessing Esau, but he was, in fact, in fact, blessing Jacob. And so Esau comes in from the field and says, here's the venison you wanted, Daddy. And he says, 
who are you? I'm Esau, your son. <laughs> he said, but who was the guy that was here before? And he shall be blessed. Look at verse 38. And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, my, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven above. And by thy sword shalt thou live and shalt serve thy brother. Thanks, Dad. <laughs> but that was the blessing. That was what God had established. And it shall come to pass that when thou shalt have dominion, that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then will I slay my brother Jacob. So Esau, he is the father of the nations that inhabit what we pretty much know now as Jordan and Syria. Is there still any problems with Jordan, Syria, and Israel? Man, this thing's been going on for a long time. But God said, I'm going to establish a covenant. It's going to go from Abraham. It's going to be with Isaac, not Ishmael. It's going to be with Jacob, not Esau. And God was very specific about the ethnic bloodline of his covenant. All right, secondly... It was not because Israel was any more righteous. So God said, I'm going to establish this people. I'm going to start with Abraham. It's going to go to Isaac and Jacob. Jacob's going to have 12 sons. They're going to have lots and lots of sons and grandsons. And then they're going to become a nation, which, of course, historically we know happened. And, you know, people will oftentimes object and they'll say, well, that's racist. You know, that, that's uh, that's uh, uh, uh you know, favoritism, where God is showing favoritism, it's not because they were better than everybody else. And the Bible makes that very clear. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 9. God did not make a covenant with them because they were so good that he chose them like, oh, you're the best of the whole world. He made a covenant with them to demonstrate his power and his glory through them. All right, look at Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse number 4. Deuteronomy 9, verse number 4, Speak not thou in thine heart, after that the Lord thy God hath cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness the Lord hath brought me in to possess this land, but for the wickedness of those, these nations the Lord doth drive them out from before thee. Not for thy righteousness, or for the uprightness of thine heart, dost thou go to possess their land, but for the wickedness of these nations the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee, that he may perform the word which the Lord swear unto thy fathers. God's going to keep his promise. And God said, I'm going to do all this. It has nothing to do with how good you are, but it has to do with my promise, and I'm going to keep my word. And then he says this, unto thy fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's one of the instances where you see them put together. Verse number six, understand therefore, that the Lord thy God giveth thee not this good land to possess it for thy righteousness, for thou art a stiff-necked people. So he's, saying, he's making it very, very clear. It has nothing to do with you guys. And, and look up here. It, you know, the grace of Christ has nothing to do with us. It has to do with the goodness of Christ, right? But so God chose a, 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 an individual, built from that man a nation through his sons and grandsons, etc., and it wasn't because of they were special, but because God was special. And he was demonstrating to the entire world, if people will observe my covenant and follow me and worship me, there will be nothing that can stop them and nothing that can harm them. All right. Now, thirdly, that special place was conditional. We touched on this last week on keeping up their end of the covenant. And if they didn't keep up their end of the covenant, what happened? They were delivered to their enemies. And they were taken into captivity. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 6. <clears throat> so we're talking about the unique place of Israel. What, is, what, is, what advantage then hath the Jew as we're talking about uh, when we first began tonight? What, what's the big deal about it? Well, they are the people of covenant, the people of promise. And it's not because they're special, but because God's special. And uh, when they don't keep up their end of the bargain, 2 Chronicles 6 and verse 36, if they sin against thee, for there is no man which sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them over before their enemies, and they carry them away captives unto a land far off or near. 
So the kings of Syria attacked them and had victory. The kings of the Chaldees, the, king, uh, the, the kings of, of the east came in. And, and for so, so several times they were taken away into captivity. Why? Because mm -hmm. they refused to obey God. Verse number 37, Yet if they bethink themselves in the land, whither they are carried captive, and turn and pray unto thee in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned, and have, we have done amiss, and have done wickedly. If they return to thee with all their heart, with all their soul, in the land of their captivity, whither they have, been, they have carried them captives, and pray toward their land, which thou gavest unto their fathers, and toward the city which thou hast chosen, and toward the house which I have built for thy name, then hear thou from the heavens, even from thy dwelling place, their prayer, and their supplications, and maintain their cause, and forgive thy people which have sinned against thee. And so you see that taking place. In the history of Israel, they're carried into captive, uh, ca captive into foreign lands. They fall before their enemies, and even in the time of, of Saul, one of the first kings, the Philistines would attack them. And when they did right, God gave them victory. And but when they weren't doing right, they weren't following God, then they would fall before the Philistines. So it, that they had that covenant, but it wasn't unconditional. Like you're better than everybody else, and nothing can ever touch you. And if you if you wonder why. Israel is having trouble and turmoil and being attacked and, and things even today. It's because they're not following God. Mm -hmm. and, and they haven't been for many, many years. So even when they were delivered, look at Leviticus 26 though. Even when they were delivered to their enemies, God did not just let their enemies take unrestrained vengeance on them. God held accountable those who went too far and attempted to utterly destroy Israel. Leviticus 26 and verse number 40. So you see, the hand of God is never completely removed. He may allow, it's just like for us now as Christians, uh, Hebrews 12 and 13 talks about that we get chastised by the Lord, but he, he, he's trying to bring us back to that place of fellowship with him. So even when they were delivered to their enemies, God still held those enemies accountable. They could only go so far. And they couldn't, you remember when in the, in, uh, the book of Esther, when Haman plotted to, to totally wipe out, to destroy every Jew in every, every realm of the nation, God said, nope, too far. Uh, Leviticus 26 and verse 40. If they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their trespasses which they have trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary to me, and that I also have walked contrary unto them, and have brought them into the land of their enemies, if then their uncircumcised hearts be humble, and then they, uh, and they then rather accept the, of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, and also my covenant with Abraham. Will I, God doesn't forget. God is never going to totally put them away. And I will remember the land, and the land also shall be left of them, and shall enjoy her Sabbath while she lieth desolate without them, and they shall accept of the punishment of their iniquity, because even because they despised my judgments, and because their soul abhorred my statutes. Look at verse 44. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away. Neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly, and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, and uh, that I might be uh, their God, I am the Lord. So God says, we've already seen two or three times, I won't forget the covenant, I will not break the covenant. Anybody who tries to tell you God is all done with Israel is telling you against the Bible. Deuteronomy 25, you don't have to turn there, but you can. Uh, verse 17 and 19, God says, Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when you were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindermost part of thee, even all that were feeble and behind thee, and when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. And God tells them to utterly destroy Amalek. Why? Because they were sniping at the rear and the weak and the people that were straggling behind. And so God says, yeah, if you don't do right, Israel, I'm going to turn you over to your enemies. You're going to go into captivity. And by the way, the Sabbath that I told you to observe in your land will be observed while you're not there. <laughs> and the land will be taken care of when, when you're not there. But if you'll turn back to me, I'll bring you back because I'm never going to forget this covenant that I made with Abraham, Isaac, 
and Jacob. So that relationship basically sums up that back and forth of history that you see with Israel all throughout the Old Testament. And you, you see that happening up and down over and over again. When they obeyed and followed God, they were blessed and protected. When they disobeyed and strayed, they were delivered to their enemies and, their, and, and into captivity. And he said, well, where were we? Where were the Gentile nations at that time? They weren't even a factor. They were the ones who had taken them into captivity. They were the heathen. They were outside of the covenant of God. And when, then, when Jesus was born as their Messiah and as the king of the Jews, Jesus lived among his people. He came unto his own, and his own received him none. He lived among them. He healed them. He ministered to them. But what happened? He came unto his own, but his own received him not. They rejected their Messiah. And so when the Jews crucified their Messiah, they literally changed the course of history, and the plan for Christ's kingdom was not, not um, destroyed, it was deferred. The physical kingdom was set aside in favor of the spiritual kingdom that we talked about last week, the kingdom of God. So that brings us to the book of Acts. You say, boy, you're skipping. Do you really want me to go through verse by verse and chapter by chapter? I know some of you already, your eyes are rolling back in your head. Uh, sometimes I, I wonder, like, I want to give you the full picture, but then it's like I see somebody like, you know, like, like your, your cheeks are just back. I know I throw out a lot of information. I'm not trying to overwhelm you. I'm trying to give you, just try to get the overall picture. Okay? There's a special covenant with ethnic, what's ethnic mean? They're literally genealogically, physically connected through a bloodline to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're Jewish by bloodline. And there's a special covenant with them that God will never forget. And so you get all the way up to their Messiah. They reject their Messiah. He's crucified. And you get to the book of Acts chapter 2. And Acts chapter 2 is a place where a lot of apostolic pastors and churches get really messed up. Because they're not reading the fact that Peter is talking here and preaching to a Jewish audience. He's not preaching to born-again believers. He's preaching to Jews who had just crucified their Messiah. Acts chapter 2, verse number 5 through 8. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews. I don't know what it says in the other Bibles, but if they remove it, that's one of the reasons why they're suspect. It, they're Jews. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. So even at that time, Jewish people had, had gone to other nations and things, but they came back for the festivals and the feasts and things that they were supposed to observe. But they're Jewish. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? That is the gift of tongues. Amen. It's not hostile shantala untie your bow tie. It has nothing to do with any of that kind of stuff. Hey, da la 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 shot da la 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 blah blah blah. I can stand up here and speak gibberish. That's not tongues. Tongues is a known language. It wasn't known to those people from the region of Galilee, but it sure made sense to the people hearing it. That's what it says. How here we? He said these are Galileans. Galileans were like they were like people from the. Uh, I'm not going to get myself in trouble by identifying people. They were people who were not considered. They were they were fishermen like Peter, James, and John. They were, they were people who were workers. They were not considered the educated class. And it's like, how did these uneducated Galileans? How are they? How are we hearing all this in our own language? Because you look in, in Acts chapter two, the next few verses, and there's people from Phrygia, and there's people from Lydia, there's people from all over the Roman Empire who were speaking the language of where they were living, but they came back and they heard in their own language. That was the gift of tongues. There's one thing the apostolics have messed up. All right, chapter 22 uh, and verse 22. Chapter 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel. Well, who would that be? Jews. That's who he's talking to. Hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth. A man approved of God among you by miracles and, wo and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye, who's ye? 
You Jewish Israelites here in Jerusalem, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So he's calling them out on the crucifixion. He's saying, listen, you guys stand, stood by here. If you weren't the one of the ones calling, crucify and crucify, you allowed it to happen. You're, you're uh, culpable. You're to blame here for this. All right, look at verse 32. So he said, you've taken this Jesus and by uh, wicked hands crucified and slain. This Jesus, verse 32, hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which he now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel, of Israel yeah. know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He is Christ, the Messiah, the promised one, but he's also Lord because his foes have been made his footstool. Now, when they heard this, who's they? Israelite Jews dwelling at Jerusalem. When they heard the fact that you guys are to blame and that one that you crucified and hung on a tree, God raised from the dead, and he's not only Christ, but he's also Lord. When they heard this, they were pricked with, uh, in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Now look up here. What shall we do in light of what? In light of the fact we've just crucified our Messiah. Mm -hmm. You remember in, in Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer says, What must I do to be saved? Not the same question. That was a Gentile saying, what do I do to be born again? They're saying, we have crucified our Messiah. He is Lord and Christ. What do we do about that? Mm -hmm. All right. Verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children. How do you not know that and read the Bible? And to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Not save yourself from your sins. Save yourself from being uh, accountable for crucifying your Messiah. What do we do? We crucify. Yes, yes, we're to blame for that. What do we do about it? Is there a way out of this? Yes. Repent and be baptized in Jesus' name. What was that? As a public confession that we have accepted him as the Messiah. We missed it the first time. We got it right this time. Okay? And that's Acts 2.38. And so that's what some of the apostolic churches will use to teach baptismal regeneration. Which is that you and I have to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. That's not to us. He's talking to Jews about a very specific thing because they crucify them. So tongues and baptismal regeneration, uh, as taught by the apostolic churches, uh, is not biblically correct. And if you understand the unique place of Israel, then you'll understand why. Okay. All right, so this right here is, as I mentioned, where the apostolic de denominations get messed up because they're not rightly dividing the word of truth and they're not properly recognizing the place of Israel. It's absolutely essential that we recognize the unique place place rather that Israel holds in God's plans and in scripture we have to be able to distinguish and it's found right in 1 Corinthians 10 32 is God talking to Jews Gentiles or the church of God he says that I, I, I give no offense to the Jews to the Gentiles nor to the church of God there's three groups in the Bible you have to know who God's talking to when you're reading your Bible so the church as a body of believers in Jesus Christ did not even exist before the Jews rejected their Messiah. And when the Jews rejected their Messiah, we got kind of plugged in, literally. So last time I didn't talk about, to you about Romans 11, but this time we're going to go there. Romans chapter 11, because this is the picture that God paints. So God had this, this tree, if you will, this olive tree he uses here in Romans chapter 11, which represented Israel. 
And that was, that was the people of his covenant. That was his plan. But because they rejected him and departed from him, then the branch, he, the picture here is like a branch being broken off the tree because of their rejection. And God took us as a wild tree and plugged us in to that tree. So we became part of it through Jesus Christ. Look at Romans chapter 11, verse number 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? Some people will try to tell you. And again, you tell them, when somebody says God's all done with Israel, you look at them and say, no, he's not, and you're crazy and a Bible rejecter. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Did he? No. Will he? No. Has he ever? No, no, no. He has always at times set them aside. He has delivered them to their enemies. He allowed them to go into captivity. But he is never all done until everything he covenanted with them is complete. Look at verse number 25. Romans eleven twenty-five. 25. For I would not, brethren that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Notice that uh, deliverer is capitalized there because it's a reference to the returning Christ mm -hmm. when he comes as the deliverer. And for this is my covenant with them, when I shall take away their sins. So the deliverer, the, the Messiah, is going to return, and he's going to finish what he started. So right now, they rejected their Messiah, and right now, that covenant has been temporarily set aside, while God brings Jew and Gentile together in the church of Christ, the kingdom of God. And when we're taken out in the rapture, he's going to resume, pick right up where he left off. And, and he's going to finish what he started. Look at verse number uh, 11. So where do we fit in with this? Romans 11, verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. Again, is God all done with them? Are, is, are they completely finished? No, God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles. For to provoke them to Gentiles. We got in... Because they rejected, so I, you know, from a from a scriptural perspective, we can't really applaud like, yes, they rejected their Messiah. But for personal reasons, yes, we got in because they rejected their Messiah. Look at verse number seventeen. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, that is, we Gentiles, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, now. I don't know a lot about botany and things like that, but I know, in fact, we have a tree in our backyard. Some of you have seen that in the corner. It's huge now. And that was literally a tree with a bush that was grafted on top of it. And then they grew together. And so now the branches and the foliage of that bush are, are huge, but it came from a trunk of a tree. And you can take part of one tree and and sometimes they'll do that in orchards they'll take part of a tree and they'll literally they'll cut off a branch and they'll bind those things together and so the the tree kind of heals itself and grows together but it's from two distinct things and that's literally what he's talking when it says graft in that's what happened to us so that branch of israel was broken off by their rejection and we got grafted in through jesus christ all right, so we were grafted among them, and with them partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Boast not thyself against, boast not it rather against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. In other words, hey, let's not get high and mighty with the Jews. You know, we, we got in because of what they started. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. And so it is a high privilege and a great grace of God that we got in at all. Uh, look at verse number 24. If thou wert cut off, or cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and wert grafted in contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, 
which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree. So, you know, are we get, are, we're saved and God's all done with it? No, God's going to bring us all together through Jesus Christ. And then that's where he just talks about, I would not that you be ignorant of this mystery and, and be wise in your own conceits. Blindness in part has happened to Israel, excuse me, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So somebody who will teach you that the promises of, and the covenant of God with the Jews is all over, they're ignorant and they're blind. It just said that. All right? Uh, and they're wise in their own conceit. So the promises of God to Israel are confirmed. All through Scripture. Multiple. We're not looking at all. Trust me, we're not looking at all of them. I'm giving you a snapshot. Uh, they're confirmed even though they rejected their Messiah the first time that he came. So the gospel was uh, first preached to the Jews so that they had more than one opportunity to reject their Messiah. It wasn't just like, oh, they crucified him, that was it. The gospel was first taken to the Jews. Look at Acts chapter 13, verse 45. Let's run these real quick. Acts 13, 45. So here's Paul preaching to the Jews. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. So the, the Orthodox Jews were opposing Paul preaching a salvation through Christ, and they started actually blaspheming. Verse 46, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. You see that again, I won't take time to read it all, in Acts chapter 18, verses 5 and 6. In verse 6, they opposed themselves and blasphemed, and Paul says, my hands are clean, from henceforth I'll go to the Gentiles. Again in Acts chapter 28, a different situation later on. Uh, Paul is preaching to them, and they, they refuse to hear uh, what he has to say. They refuse to listen to the gospel. And he says, verse number 28 of Acts 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent to the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. So three times in the book of Acts, God, first of all, uh, he sent them their Messiah. And uh, it says, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 15, 24, that I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He went to the Jews first, but they rejected it. Not only that, but he sent his messengers, the disciples, he sent them to the Jews first. Matthew 10 and verse 5 says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, listen, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so Jesus, as the Messiah, came. Jesus, the Messiah, sent his messengers first to the Jews. Paul and, and Peter preached to the Jews first. And they rejected, and they rejected, and they rejected. So the gospel was made equally available to the Gentiles from Acts chapter 10 on. That's Cornelius. And it will remain that way until God comes and catches us away. Because of their rejection. And it wasn't just a single rejection. So then, lastly, you consider the prophecies of the Messiah. So God made promises to his covenant people. He said, I'm going to send you a Messiah, and here's what he's going to do. Those are what they call messianic prophecies, prophecies of the Messiah. And so of the prophecies of Messiah, some were specifically to the Jews. But then there were ones that were fulfilled to the Gentiles also. For example, the death, burial, and resurrection. That's for the whole world. That, that turned out to be for the whole world, Jews and Gentiles alike. But the promises for national deliverance, like delivering the nation, ethnic nation of Israel, that was for the Jews. Uh, and, and the province of, uh, promise of having the Davidic kingdom, uh, the, that someone would sit on the throne of his father David, that was for the Jews. So let me just elaborate on this a little bit and we'll be done. Jesus fulfilled many prophecies of the Messiah when he came the first time. Was he born of a virgin? Yes. Was he born in Bethlehem? Yes. Was he a descendant of King David? Yes. Did he flee to Egypt and later return? Yes. Um, was he preceded by a messenger, as the scripture said? Yes. Did he for perform miracles of healing? Yes. Uh, would he die innocently for sins? Yes. Did he rise again as he was uh, said he was going to? Yes. Did he minister to those who were suffering and captives? Yes, he did. And look with me at this one, Luke chapter 4 and verse 17. Jesus even testified of this himself in Luke chapter 4 and verse number 17. 
So here in Luke 4, Jesus is really just starting his public ministry. And he's in a synagogue, and they give him the book of Isaiah to read. And he says, There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's quoting from Isaiah. Because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. So those are, we know now, prophecies of the Messiah. And so he's reading that, and he said, here's what Isaiah wrote. And he closed the book, verse number 20, and gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them that are in the synagogue were fastened on him. So here's this man people had heard tell of Jesus. And he's reading with, a, you can imagine, exceptional power reading the scriptures. And everybody is just hushed. Eyes fastened upon him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. He was claiming to be the prophesied Messiah. He was claimed to, so, so he did these things. He, he preached of the kingdom of heaven and he, and he told the ways of God and he healed people and he, he died for sins and he was born where he was supposed to be born by a virgin and all those kind of things. So every time that you read in the gospels that it might be fulfilled by, that it might be fulfilled, you remember reading that in, in the gospels? It's really generally referring to some Old Testament prophecy that Jesus was fulfilled. So when he came in into Jerusalem in the triumphal entry, uh, riding on a colt, the foal of an ass, he did that so that he could fulfill scripture because he was the Messiah. So many of those messianic prophecies were fulfilled when he came the first time. But Jesus did not fulfill all. You say, oh, well, that's all right. He got, most, got it mostly right. That's what Abraham thought. <laughs> well, God, you got it mostly right. Let Ishmael live before you. God said, no, your wife, Sarah, is going to have a son about this time next year, and his name is called Isaac, and I, I hear you about Ishmael. I'll bless him, but that's not my plan. My plan is Isaac. So because God's plan called for a period of grace that, by the way, we're now living in, hallelujah, before Jesus returned to complete the rest of his unfulfilled prophecies. So you say, well, he didn't fulfill all of them. What about the rest of them? He's coming back. Mm -hmm. And he's going to do exactly what he said. Mm -hmm. That's why you read things. Look at Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, and verse number 15. You read things spoken by John the Baptist, for example. And those kind of things can cause confusion. Uh, <clears throat> because people don't study their Bible. And they don't divide it right. <clears throat> So Luke chapter 3 and verse number 15, and as the people were in expectation and all men mused in their hearts of John, that's John the Baptist, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh that uh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And there go the apostolics again. But what's he talking about? He's talking about the two features of the Messiah. Did Jesus give us the Holy Ghost? Yes. Amen. Have we had the baptism of fire? No. Because what is that? Look at verse 17. Whose fan is in his hand, he will truly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff will he burn with unquenchable fire. Let me tell you something. That's not the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's not the baptism of fire. It's not the cloven tongues of fire of Acts chapter 2. That's the second coming when Jesus Christ comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on all them that know not God. Mm -hmm. And you don't want any part of that. <laughs> you don't want any part of that baptism at all. <clears throat> So most of the unfulfilled prophecies have to do with Christ's second coming uh, when he will set up his kingdom and rule on the throne of David. Let's look at just one example, Isaiah chapter 9, and verse number 6 and 7. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 9, and verse number 6 and 7. So here is an example of some, some of the prophecies of Messiah that have not, listen to me carefully, not yet been fulfilled. God is not done. He's not going to alter his plan. He's not going to leave something out. He's not going to say, oh, it was close enough. God doesn't work that way. He doesn't forget his covenant. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. 
and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. But he never was in government the first time. And his, his time on earth did end for a while. So what's the deal? It's not been destroyed, it's been deferred for the time of this time of grace. The government is, his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom. You say, well, symbolically, that it means nothing symbolically. Mm -hmm. It means it literally, physically. He will sit down in Jerusalem, in Israel, on a throne, physically reigning over this earth for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So you don't just kind of come close. You don't put it into mythology and metaphors and symbology and all that kind of stuff. He said, I'm going to do this. So then you get questions like this in Matthew chapter 20 and verses 20 and 21. James and John's mother comes before the Lord, and, and he said unto her, What wilt thou? In verse 21. She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons sit the one on thy right hand and the other on the left in thy kingdom. Because they were expecting, you are the Christ, you're going to set up your kingdom right now. They missed the thing that is going to be deferred for a while. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6. Acts chapter 1, of course, is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, before, just before he's ascended up into heaven, and just a couple verses later he will be. But Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6, When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, look at this, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Are you going to set up your throne right here, right now? Are you going to displace the Roman Empire? And are you going to start ruling like the Messiah is supposed to? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power. Now, they, they had a fundamental misunderstanding of it, and we can get that from the times they didn't understand. We're looking back on it now, but it must have been a huge disappointment. <laughs> they thought, finally! He's resurrected. This is it. That, not, not now. What do you mean? Not, now's a good time as ever, Lord. Right? So uh, it's the timing and the nature of that kingdom that people get so confused over. And they try to make it all kinds of things that involve our actions and our decisions and our timing. But it has nothing to do with us. It's all in the hands of the Father. He said, when's Christ coming back? When's it all going to happen? When, when God's good and ready. Amen. Well, what are we supposed to be doing? Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Amen. So as we looked at last week, this will occur by in sequence. It will occur after the church is taken out in the rapture and at the end of the tribulation, according to Revelation chapter 19. So we can see the sequence of events, but only God knows the timing. We can't determine the clock and the calendar. No man knows the day, no man knows the hour, but we can see the sequence of events. And so right now, the grace of God is equally available to Jew and Gentile. There's no difference when it comes to our eternal standing before God. But God still has a special place for Jews in the physical realm. Excuse me, what do I mean by that? God will still bless the nations that bless Israel and curse the nations that curse Israel, depending on how they treat Israel. God will still, and has still, specially protected Israel. You ought to, if you don't read the book, watch the movie about the 1967 war. Egypt, Syria, Jordan, there's five different nations, Lebanon, I think. They were all gathered again, planes, bombs, everything. You know what? God just gave them the victory. Israel wiped them out. You need, you need to study that history. It's amazing. It's amazing. Is God in our generation, my generation anyway, not in your generation, you're too young. But in my generation, that's God working on Israel's behalf. You say, why? Because there's no, nothing special about them. Something special about him. Amen. Not because of their righteousness. So Jewish people still must come to God through Christ. Even though they're Jews, they still have to be saved through Jesus Christ, same as us. But God has not forgotten the promises 
that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and to their seed. So Christ will return to deliver Israel nationally. And if you think that there's nations in the Mideast that are against Israel and, and want to wipe out Israel right now, man, thank God you're not going to be here in the tribulation. Because it is, it is a terrible time of betrayal for Israel. And so, but Christ will return at the end of the tribulation and deliver them as a nation from their enemies. And that's all through the book of Joel. It's through, through, through the book of Revelation, through the book of uh, Malachi, Zechariah, many different places. Through the book of Daniel, Christ will finish what he started. He will accomplish all of the promises. Christ Amen. will set up his kingdom. He will sit on the throne of David Amen. in Jerusalem. It's just blindness in part has happened to Israel until what we're living in the time of the Gentiles is completed and God will then conclude his plan for Israel. So what does that mean for us as Christians? What are we supposed to do with that information? So we understand they have a special unique place. It started with a, a covenant that was thousands and thousands of years ago. God's never forgotten. He's never deviated from it. He's this temporarily deferred at this time that God will complete it. So what does it mean for us as Christians? Well, practically, we don't take sides against Israel. If Israel does something wicked and wrong and, you know, they, they you know, a path, a genocide, apartheid, all the things that people like to accuse Israel of right now, God will deal with that. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to war. I'm not going to be protesting against Israel. I'm not taking sides against Israel. Mm -hmm. If there's a problem, God will take care of it, okay? Uh, but we don't take sides against Israel. We still need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 122, verse 6 says, Pray for the peace of, the, of Jerusalem. Blessed are they that love thee. So we need to pray for their protection and for the wisdom of their leader. We need to pray, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And uh, we need to look forward to the time when Christ is going to ascend his throne. You say, well, what do we get out of that? Why, can we stop thinking about what? We've gotten more than what we deserved out of Christ already. We need to be looking forward to saying, He deserves his rightful place of glory and honor on Amen. that throne as king of kings. And we need to try to point Jewish people today to their risen redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But also we need to pay attention to when we're reading our Bible. Why, why did I give you all this information? Because there's so much false doctrine. From apostolic doctrine to kingdom doctrine to things that we talked about last week with keeping the law and all that kind of because people don't understand the special unique place that Israel holds in the Bible so when you're reading you need to pay attention to who God is talking to and when he is talking to them as we read the scripture the physical seed of Abraham Isaac and Jacob have some special consideration as heirs to that covenant with Abraham and his generations. But we are heir to another covenant, a covenant of grace Amen. through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we will rule and reign with Christ in his eternal kingdom after the renovation by the fire. But the millennial kingdom, that thousand year kingdom on earth is primarily fulfilling the promise to the Jews where God is going to complete everything that he started, he's going to fulfill every promise. Anything about the Messiah that is as yet unfulfilled will be fulfilled to the letter because God has not forsaken his covenant. All right, there, got that off my chest. I hope it was helpful to you tonight. But seriously, when you're reading through your Bible, that having that context, having that perspective of things will help you to see things and make sense out of things that oftentimes can be confusing about the kingdoms and about who's about Jew, Gentile, Church of God, Kingdom of God versus Kingdom of Heaven, Law versus Grace. Those are fundamental things of divisions and separations you have to make. You start jumbling them together, that's where you get all kinds of false teaching. Okay? Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. I pray that you would bless it to our hearts. God, give us understanding. Help us to remember these things. Lord, I thank you so much for John chapter 8, verse 32. It says you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Amen. And so, God, I thank you for the freedom that comes from the Word of God and the leading of the Spirit of God. And I pray that you'd help us to uh, teach and, and uh, help others, Lord. And I pray that you'd help us to know how to expose false doctrine, how to reject it, and God, also how to uh, direct people to the 
one and only King of kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.